So welcome everyone to the first of three webinars in our second webinar series, Collaborating with Carbon. Today we are joined by our expert panelists, Lorraine Gordon, Rowan Clark, and Amanda Scott. And this webinar explores the topic of a fairer deal together and looks at how we can work collaboratively to harness the opportunities in soil carbon farming and trading. To it, today we'll be considering how can collaborating best utilise carbon trading opportunities for farmers and if there is opportunity for carbon co-ops. Farmers are set to be the major suppliers of environmental goods and services using mechanisms such as the carbon credit market. As these markets continue to uh, grow in volume, scope and scale, it is important that farmers get fair access. Today we'll be looking at the potential for more farmers to gain access to a fairer deal from the environmental goods and services market by working together. The structure of today's webinar is that each of our panellists will share their thoughts and opinions on this topic based on their extensive experience and expertise. And following this, we'll hold a panel discussion facilitated through a Q&A invitation to the audience. And just a little bit of Zoom etiquette. I know we're all extremely familiar with it after being online for the last, feels like forever, 18 months. Um, but I'll just talk you through how we're gonna run it today. So um, first up, you, you've come in with your mics muted. And during the Q&A session, there will be opportunity for you to get on the mic and ask your questions if you'd like to, at which point I'll just ask you to raise your hand and I'll turn your microphone on. Um, if you'd like to have your cameras on, um, you're more than welcome to have your cameras on so we can see who you are. It's always lovely, um, but obviously there's, um, you don't have to do that. I assume everyone can see the chat. Um, if during the presentations you want to make any comments or ask any questions, feel free to pop them in the chat at any time and we'll come back to them during the Q&A session at the end. Um, and also just be aware this webinar is being recorded and will be placed on the Farming Together website in the coming weeks, along with our other webinars from the first series. So I will make a start. Um, first up, it's my pleasure to introduce Lorraine Gordon. Now, it's hard to condense Lorraine's amazing experience and expertise into um, a couple of short minutes, but I'm going to give it a go. So Lorraine is Director of Strategic Projects at Southern Cross University. She's the founder of the National Regenerative Agriculture Alliance, also known as RA, RAA which is based out of Southern Cross University. And Lorraine is known for acting as a conduit between industry and research, delivering sustainable and regenerative agriculture, agriculture solutions nationally. Lorraine has facilitated and assisted over 28,000 farmers, fishers and foresters around the country to, progr to progress collaborative projects and establish cooperatives, which will benefit their various industries as director of the multi-award winning Commonwealth Government's Farming Together program. As such, Lorraine was award awarded the 2018 Rural Community Leader of the Year for Australia for her work with farmers. Um, I'd say at her heart and at the core of what she does, Lorraine is a carbon farmer and holistic beef cattle trader at Ebor in the New England tablelands of New South Wales, where she uses timed controlled grazing methods to turn off up to a thousand steers per annum. A graduate of the Australian Rural Leadership Program and previous New South Wales ABC Rural Woman of the Year, Lorraine is currently completing a PhD in Region Ag with a focus on ecological economics through UNE, looking at triple bottom line comparisons between Region Ag and conventional grazing systems. Over to you, Lorraine, thank you very much. Thank you, Simone. Um, and after all that, it remains to be seen whether I can share my screen um, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> without any uh, hiccups. Okay, how are we going? Can we see that? Yes, beautiful. Okay. Um, look, it is afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you so much for coming on to this, um, this webinar or this Zoom session. Um, I'm quite excited about it, actually, because it covers two out of three of my very favourite topics. Um, it covers both carbon and co-ops. 
and just touches on my third favourite topic, which is regenerative agriculture. So uh, as Simone said, and I don't, I'm going to not try to rant and rave for too long because um, we're going to want to hear from Rowan and Amanda as well, uh, and we'll have questions at the end. But most importantly for me, as Amanda, uh, I'm sorry, as Simone just alluded to, is I am a, a, a cattle farmer and a carbon farmer. And um, for me, it's really important to be able to walk the talk and to make the mistakes and to be an early adopter. And I guess that's uh, what I've tried to do. I don't really wanna be out there talking about carbon if I haven't done it myself um, and got my hands dirty and really made all the mistakes. farming together and uh, my own endeavours at our farm. So um, firstly, won't click, ah, there you go. A couple of pictures of my farm, got to have that up front. I just love this one and uh, I guess that's what regenerative agriculture is all about and that's what we all aim to uh, be looking at um, and, and what we aspire to in many regards and I wish all my property looked like that but uh, yeah, many parts of it do, which is which is why I feel quite blessed to be in this space. So, um, and apologies for those that have heard some of my carbon um, presentations before. I'm going to keep it quite basic, um, just so that we can get on to the important thing about is there an opportunity here for us to work together in the space and collaborate in the space. We first need to know that there are many suitable to be a carbon farmer. So that's what I guess the first step is, the carbon ready assessment and appraisal. You know, are you the sort of operation that is open to new ideas and open to doing things differently? Because the one thing about carbon sequestration and being a carbon farmer is that you actually have to come up with some new methodologies to build carbon. It's not business as usual. And that can be quite confronting and challenging to, um, to many farmers. And of course, then you need to put in place, once you've come to that decision, a carbon management plan. So look, without going into it too deeply, um, these are the various steps in their various orders. And I'll talk a little bit um, further on about what to be aware of, what to be careful of, and um, some, of, uh, some tips around going down this path. So I'm, I'm not going to talk too much about regenerative agricultural techniques, but I will say this, um, this is what doesn't build carbon in the soil. So I guess as potential carbon farmers in the future, these are the things you're going to need to have some serious consideration of, you know, paddocks of bare soil with lack of ground cover, just don't build carbon. Monocrops with lack of biodiversity, don't build carbon. And uh, spraying out paddocks prior to sowing new pastures and crops, again, is a no-no. Set stocking, overuse of synthetic chemicals and fertilisers and pesticides. I say overuse, not no use. Um, can be detrimental as well, particularly to our fungal communities and uh, over tillage and disturbance of the soil. So it's important just to keep those dot points um, in the back of your mind if you're thinking of going down this path. It's a pretty hard journey if um, some of these uh, activities fit your management routine. I guess the other important thing to realise about carbon before we talk about the collaborations around it is that there are many ways of realising value and selling your carbon credits. And, um, I guess the most important thing is you need to register with the ERF. That's really important because it gives you options down the track. You don't actually need to lock into contracts straight away. You don't need to have that in place. Carbon is actually only going, the, the price of carbon is only going in one direction, I believe, and that's up. Um, so it'd be, it'd be silly to be locking into contracts now when you can realise more value down the track. But there are, there are um, different markets. There are your corporate markets, as well as your government um, managed markets. 
And of course, then there's things, other things you can do, which is in the carbon plus space where you can sort of stack carbon, so to speak. So you can also use biodiversity credits and offsets um, and all sorts of marketing stories around the way that you manage your farm. And that may also include being involved with a, a verification system, verifying the way you farm is looking after the environment, um, which is probably another presentation in itself. But there's all sorts of stories that you can build around your farm to make it attractive, particularly to the corporate market. Uh, and without going into all of those different options of how you sell carbon, be aware there are many ways you can go about that. So enter the potential for carbon co-ops. Um, there is lots of potential in this space um, or carbon collaborations. Uh, here's a list of dot points that I've sort of extracted out um, that I think are quite valuable and why we should try and do this together. The important thing is, if we are gonna go down this, this space or go down this pathway into being carbon farmers, it's so much easier to walk that path together, to be learning together, to be um, learning from each other's mistakes uh, and just to have that support around you. And I think that's probably one of the biggest areas I see potential for carbon co-ops. Um, of course, there's the other advantage of once you get a bit of scale by being involved with a group of farmers, you have a bigger story to tell when it comes to the corporate market. Um, excuse me, I'll just wave my arms so my lights go back on. And um, so, you know, there's a lot of different benefits of walking the pathway together. And co-ops are ideally set up to be able to um, capitalise on this. So some of the other areas I can see potential um, with carbon co-ops is the fact that there's an awful lot of administration involved in being a carbon farmer. There's a lot of paperwork, there's a lot of clunky legislation around it um, at the moment. And um, you could literally consume all your time just trying to get your head around what, you know, what comes next and what you've got to do. So, I think the potential here is for collaborations to employ somebody full time to do that, to do all the administration work um, and put all that into place. And also you can employ somebody that has the knowledge of how the back end works and, um, and how the, uh, the wheels turn in the carbon world. Now, this is where aggregators, I guess, come in and this is where aggregators as such make their money. They sort of, advocate to take all that away from the farmer and do that all for them. And in many cases, they'll even advocate to um, pay for their baselining uh, soil testing. Now, of course, as we all know, we're, we're very pragmatic, us farmers, is that nothing is for free. And so when you sign up with those sorts of deals, they're going to want their fair share out the other end. and be aware some of those aggregations can take quite large um, profits out the other end of up to 30%. Uh, so in many, in many uh, cases, you know, you're best to pay your own baselining costs and your own costs up front. But if it's in a cooperative structure, then all that benefit comes back to the members. It's for the good of all. It's not for the good of one. So um, again, that's a, a really good reason to start to band together and uh, consider you know, establishing a carbon co-op. Um, I'm already talking to quite a large cooperative at the moment in this space that are looking at uh, taking their members along the cooperative path um, of carbon farming. And um, I can see some some really fantastic benefits that will come out of that. And like I said, you can read that list for yourself. I think the education, the support, the marketing, the administrational sides, the data, um, and the potential just to tell a wonderful story to the consumer is all there. So uh, I'm a big advocate for it. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about this because we have Rowan Clark, um, who's going to no, no doubt talk about the Farmers Mutual. 
um, which is a, a fabulous initiative and it's built around this environmental stewardship and is looking at all sorts of market mechanisms, um, not just carbon, but biodiversity credits and offsets. Same thing on a larger scale. Um, and again, you know, it can, it can just reduce the risk involved in, a, in one farming organisation or farming family going down this path alone. It does reduce transaction costs um, and enhanced value because you're all of a sudden a larger a group that is attractive to the marketplace, better data governance and management and improved accountability. So I'm not going to talk too much more about that because I'd rather you hear Rowan's presentation on how that's all going first. Um, getting back to these nine steps, I've just highlighted um, in red the ones that I can see some huge benefit in the cooperative space, you know, that carbon ready assessment and appraisal. Well, that can all be done up front before you have to pay the experts to come in and go through the, with the individual farmers on that. You know, you can have those workshops and field days and meetings to get you, so farmers can learn together and get their head around what this is all about. So that step is really a great step to do as a group. Um, and considering, considering if we go down to four, the different um, selling systems, again, you know, the farmers can talk amongst each other on what might suit them best and, and consider their options there. And annual reviews of, their, of management plans, you know, making sure that your compliance is in place and your auditing is going to be, you're going to get all those ticks of approval with your audit process that again can be done as a group to make sure you're all on track with what you need to do. Um, and even the cost of, of independent auditing can be brought down enormously in that regard. So, I mean, there's a space here in all of those steps for the, the cooperative structure or the collaboration, um, but they're, they're just a few that I got quite excited about the potential of. Um, and here's in red again of this slide I've brought back to show that here's where you become quite attractive to the marketplace when you're a larger group. You know, that secondary market will certainly be looking at for scale. So it's hard to get the sort of scale that the corporate market is looking for if you're um, one individual farm. And that scale can become very attractive to the corporates. And, um, you know, all these other areas, the carbon plus stories of, of flora and fauna and everything else that's going on on your place can be a huge, um, a huge benefit. So there's um, some of the options for realising value and how much they're enhanced through collaborative models. Um, finally, I'm going to wrap up here, but just some carbon farming tips because I don't want to have an audience and not um, share this. Please, um, baseline, if you're going to go down this path, baseline where you're at and register with the government because you can't go back retrospectively um, in five years' time when you've discovered you have built carbon and then think you're going to get paid for it. It doesn't work that way. So you're better off to register. Um, it doesn't mean if you don't build carbon that you necessarily need to... Um, you know, you've got nothing to sell, but at least you've done it the right way and you've got an option down the track. Understand that the prices vary enormously um, from $15, I've heard up to $50. Um, so, you know, there's all sorts of options, um, both government and corporate markets. Understand you do need to adopt, adopt regenerative practices if you want to be able to um, sequester carbon. Um, they go hand in hand. And, um, and of course, there's a lot of research going on at the moment in the methodologies. Be careful, there are some proposing methodologies out there that don't stack up, they don't have rigour. Uh, so it's important that um, you do your homework. And again, that's why it, the beauty of doing it as a group together makes so much sense. And that's me done. And I'm not sure, Simone, are we having questions at the end and flipping to Rowan or whatever? Yeah, I'll... yeah, that's the plan. Yeah, well, thanks so much, Lorraine. 
Beautiful. And I even learned something. I'm, I'm working with you all the time and still learned something from your presentation. So thank you, really highlighting the benefits of carbon collaboratives and, and working together on that. It's beautiful. Um, it is now my pleasure to introduce Rowan Clark from Ethical Fields. Rowan is an expert in financial management, performance measurement, and other value reporting, um, cooperative formation, fundraising, and farm advocacy and member engagement. With 20 years of investment banking experience and a decade in community development, Rowan is well-placed and a highly sought after expert who has engaged with a range of farming cooperatives across multiple industries. His specialties include business plan development, forming cooperatives, engaging and aligning stakeholders and members and structuring and raising the capital required to deliver growth. It's an absolute pleasure to have you here, Rowan, and I'm very much looking forward to your presentation. Well, just... All right, Dan. Good day, everyone. Um, Thank thanks you. for that introduction. That was um, more glowing than I deserve, I think, particularly given I'm going to rely on the... My background is in finance, as you just heard, so I don't have an agricultural background. My, the, 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 my key co-founder in, in the uh, Regen Farmers Mutual is a guy called Andrew Ward, who has a holistic farming background, so um, I often rely on him. to uh, collaboration and how what, what opportunities there are. And I thought as a, just by way of introduction, I'll just explain what this Regen Farmers Mutual is that we're talking to, to talking about. And you can see my finance background here, like as opposed to Lorraine starting with a picture of a farm, here's three boxes with <laughs> arrows between them. So typical. Uh, so the Regen Farmers Mutual is, the, is, is a farmer-owned broker. So the idea is we're creating an entity that's farmer-owned. And the objective of, the, of that entity is for to enable farmers to, to, to have better access to environmental markets. And Lorraine spoke to some of the reasons why that's the case. Um, we now understand there's a couple of key components that sit, sit underneath the Regen Farmers Mutual that will help us deliver into that, um, into that uh, objective. One is that we uh, are aiming to create a nature fund. So uh, uh, think of it like a property fund that enables corporates and institutions to invest at the scale that they require and then the fund then invests in, in, um, in the you know, individual uh, transactions at the farm scale. So we understand there's a need for a, for a fund in order to enable that kind of matching of demand and with supply. And the other key bit that we now understand is that there needs to be an entity, we're calling it the farm contract manager, which is more of a technology play really, but it assists farmers in managing their environmental contracts, their data, and ultimately can, can enable access to green provenance. So they're the, the three things that go come together to, to deliver this Regen Farmers Mutual. This is a beautiful slide, lots of colours, but like what I'm about to talk to is just talk to talk through the uh, you know the carbon market and the environmental markets. But the point here is here is the this is from the World Bank report. This is this is like um, the the width of each of these um, bands is the total volume of uh, carbon transactions that have been undertaken in that sector. And you can see agriculture is a small sector globally currently, but expected to grow. And in Australia, it's look at, you know, the expectation is from the CSIRO that the market, the environmental market is going to be 48 billion. This is uh, somewhat tongue in cheek on my part, but this is a quote from a guy called you know, Patrick Brown, who's the CEO of Impossible Foods. He's kind of the Elon Musk of that, that uh, plant-based food kind of sector they're about to list. But what he is doing is capturing the zeitgeist. That's the reason why I've included it. And the zeitgeist, the consumer, um, consumers globally are moving towards um, understanding that um, there is uh, uh, um, large scale impacts on biodiversity and climate and that the and consumers are requiring, um, uh, ultimately driving the change that corporates are now responding to. And so farmers are key actors in any, in any change. The carbon market itself 
is um, globally is heavily uh, government dependent. So, you know, in, in Australia, 96% of the total volume is done through, you know, is, is carbon based, uh, sorry, is, is, is actually the government buying the carbon credits. But similarly in, in Europe, somewhere like Europe, it's the government regulation that is driving the, the price. So as government uh, regulates over time, they effectively are reducing supply and they increase demand by, by requiring corporates to offset their emissions. And you're seeing the price of carbon um, respond to that. Voluntary markets globally, are a, a much smaller subset, very immature, the transactions are typically bespoke and the market structure is one that actually promotes opaqueness. So it's not, it, there's, there's no incentive on the, on the brokers that sit in the middle to drive transparency um, in markets. But as I said in the previous slide, net zero uh, 2030 is this kind of expression of corporates that are responding to this push towards um, corporates being more um, responsive with respect to their, their carbon and their, and their overall environmental impacts. And what we need is for the market to, 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 to standardize in order for, for these you know, for markets to mature. By way of background, my, I uh, worked in the commodities markets back in the early 90s, and that was in the uh, base metal and energy markets. And in some ways, you know, the environmental markets are even in, more immature than those markets were then. Um, just by way of context, this is the ERF here. So this is, this, this is a, a, again, from the World Bank report. On the left-hand scale here, you have the price of carbon. So $10 a ton US. And on the right-hand scale, it's the number of kind of tons that are being covered. And so you can imagine the width of the box is the, the size of the program. And so Australia is sitting smack bang in the, in the, in the middle of the, the, the price that's, that's kind of been uh, the transactions have occurred globally. These are the 64 programs that you know, the World Bank was you know, uh, monitoring uh, the, um, globally. And so here's the uh, ERF in that context. Um, and so as I say, in Australia, very, the market's very much dominated by, has been dominated by the Commonwealth almost exclusively. But what we're seeing is um, state-based programs um, starting to emerge that actually respond to more than, more than carbon. So starting to reflect those trends around whether it's biodiversity or other um, impacts. So the land restoration uh, fund in Queensland, for example, it recognises co-benefits, whether they're cultural or um, in, environmental. Um, similarly, the program in WA, Bush Bank has a, will have a similar um, program that's being announced in the second half of the year that does have a, it's carbon plus, so it's plus biodiversity. And of course, you've got the biodiversity stewardship program that the Commonwealth have been promoting. And that again is looking to leverage the ERF to reward farmers for carbon, but also to reward them for um, biodiversity outcomes at the same time. Uh, similarly, in Australia, the voluntary markets are, are very small, so to speak. Um, and the drivers there are the corporates are seeking this social license to operate, but they're also trying to minimise cost. And so it creates an interesting dynamic where um, while the consumer is demanding change, if as corporates look to offset their carbon emissions, it clearly comes out of their profit margin. So they look to minimise those costs by blending cheap carbon from offshore with more expensive local carbon in order to create the narrative. Um, so here on the right is an example that and this was you know, buying a product from Boomi and it said, oh, you've offset 3.7 kilograms of carbon. And you can see that you know, uh, 3.2 kilograms came from a solar project in India, a dollar a, dollar a ton, whereas 0.1 of a kilo came from you know, conserving a, 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 um, some land at Mount Sandy, which has some koalas on it. And so that gave them a, a nice picture of the koalas. It does suggest that the agricultural sector has a key role to play in this because the ag, ag sector, by virtue of the fact it sits across carbon, biodiversity, and environment more generally, um, fits, fits with the, uh, the narrative. The market structure is fundamentally, um, fu fundamentally misaligned currently. So in the current market, the buyers are the customers. So a broker will go to the buy side first to find who's got the money, who, who wants to offset their, um, or to buy carbon credits. So, they, so that, so that the, their customers are the buyers and farmers are creating the product that they actually sell. And so, and the really interesting dynamic around that is that the, the way that the broker um, 
generates its revenue is by taking a percentage of the total uh, of the total revenue generated by the transaction. And typically that's you know anywhere from 30 to 50 percent of the revenue of a, a carbon transaction. So importantly that it's um, brokers are motivated and I'm coming from a former broker myself, so I understand the way the market works. As a broker, you want to keep both sides happy, particularly your customer, but like you want to keep both sides happy. And the way you do that is by promoting complexity. You try and make things as complex as possible because then people don't understand what you're actually taking out of the, the transaction. And you're seeing that play out in the market structure currently. So there's no transparency. If you go on the Carbon Marketing Market Institute website, you'll see the list of transactions that have been undertaken. That you know, you're lucky if they just disclose the volume, let alone the price. So this is this is what I mean by we need to get to a point where we we're, we're trying to standardise markets if we're going to drive efficiencies. Um, the other limiting factor in the market currently is that brokers um, can only deal at, 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 at scale that most farmers can't deal into which is why you're seeing a few transactions at single farmer level. So, but there are some key actors that want to see this change. At, at the Commonwealth government level, for example, you know, they're investing $4 million, whether it's a good idea or not, so I don't know, but like they're investing $4 million in, in creating a carbon trading platform. And one of the explicit goals there is to, to kind of break up and disrupt this current broker intermediated market. They're also investing in trying to drive down the measurement costs for soil carbon, for example. Um, uh, Corporates are also, um, while they're motivated to, to offset their, their, um, their, their carbon at minimum cost, they're also motivated to, 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 to transparency because they want increased efficiency. They want carbon at the best price. And so someone like Microsoft published uh, their early lessons from carbon, uh, from carbon transactions. And so they're trying to, to, to promote transparency with respect to their transactions. I'm part of the Biodiversity Markets Working Group that um, we, we undertook a program uh, early last year of interviewing 50 odd uh, corporates and government institutions. And through that process, we, one of the clear bits of feedback um, that, that, came, that came back was the need for greater transparency. So much so that what came out of that was the, the idea of it, creating a marketplace for nature, which is to enable the buy side to actually get better visibility about what opportunities there are and to try and create a common language. Again, heading towards transparency and standardization. Um, another interesting initiative like that's looking to, to kind of um, to, to drive uh, towards these same changes is this Carmen Farm, Farming Foundation. So Lockheed Ritchie in WA has got um, a significant uh, sum of money from a, a WA philanthropist with a view to enabling farmers to be able to do it yourself. Um, so creating the tools for farmers to be able to do it yourself so to in, in also to disintermediate the, the, the brokers, or at least um, at the front end, um, you know, creating your project. How am I doing time-wise? I will speed up. So like, so in terms of collaboration, so that, that's, that was some context about the market. So how can we change that? And we can change that through a mutual, through a cooperative. And like Lorraine spoke to the, like the idea of co-ops at the, at the local level. What we're talking about here is a national cooperative take, um, mutual. So creating, a, a structure that uh, provides the infrastructure that local groups can use. And so the idea is it, it's um, a mutual enables farmers to aggregate at the local level, reducing transaction costs, costs but also a, you know, delivering the scale that the investors needs. And then in the cooperative land, um, there's a concept of a pacemaker that like a, a, a mutual can become the price, price setter in the market. So it can actually bring down the other players in the market because it introduces competition. So under the model that we're pursuing is the idea is we'd like to drive to the farmer getting 80% of the revenue, 10% uh, of the revenue from a carbon transaction would go to the local farm group that supports that transaction. So that's the person on the ground that's providing the ongoing support, perhaps the education, and 10% goes to cover the, the overheads of the mutual itself. With the, this process, we started this process uh, oh, about eight, beginning of last year um, and we we, um, we undertook a, a three series of workshops um, which Lorraine has um, participated, participated in some of this process and through that process we were able to um, co-design it with uh, there was 80 odd farmers and some conservation groups some academics mostly farmers and we now have a steering group where there's 20, 20 farmers who are driving kind of this and what this has enabled us to do was one of the things was to identify principles 
that are now embedded in the constitutional mutual, which means that like that the idea of pharma first is embedded in this you know organ you know this organization's DNA. So everything from we're supporting local capabilities. So the idea of it's about uh, leveraging local capabilities to to enable the mutual to operate through to at the, at the tail end that you know data is um, needs to be uh, secure and um, farmers need to have control of their data. And so the idea of being written to the DNA, I think, is um, provides a level of um, comfort over and above the fact that farmers own the mutual. Um, this idea that like you can create infrastructure that, that can be leveraged locally is core to, to the mutual. So the idea that like you have um, different regions will have different opportunities and those opportunities might be, um, uh, so therefore you need to be able to create a transaction that reflects those that, 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 that local opportunity. So we have a, a flood mitigation um, uh, pilot that's in Bellinger, which has potentially soil carbon, stand up carbon, biodiversity, um, and um, going in it and flood mitigation. Whereas somewhere like in the East West Biodiversity Corridor in Victoria, it's very much it's, um, across that um, area around Bendigo, which is a bit drier, um, and it has uh, stand up carbon and um, biodiversity. So the idea that like, you know, we can cater for local collaboration is key. I missed a couple of slides, I think somehow. Oh. So I was just gonna to talk to an example of, um, this is the Bellinger um, example, where um, the idea that you can do a transaction in a local area, but bring together different elements is really, is, is really, um, interesting and key with respect to delivering you know, maximum value to, to farmers in the region. So the idea is you're trying to deliver landscape scale impacts. And that's where one plus one, it really does equal three. That like as one farmer doing a transaction on your farm, it's a different value than you get if you do it, if you get a landscape impact, because the, the landscape impact will be greater, the more farmers are involved. And so in this particular transaction pilot, we've got, um, in the upper Bellinger River, in the, in the catchment area, there's potential to do soil carbon through building up soil organic matter to retain more water up, upstream, if you like. Whereas in the valley, there's the, um, the potential to do plantings, biodiversity plantings along the river and also other plantings to slow um, and slow and, um, and um, um, reduce the impact of flooding. And so that can be both be bio, biodiversity and carbon. And whereas at the coast, you've got uh, estuaries where um, you've got flood in, in, well, flooding coming downstream, but also inundation from you know, um, uh, tides and rising sea levels. And so that the, over time, there's, there's the need to connect to biodiversity areas um, from where they currently exist to, to further inland. So the idea that we could bring those three um, elements together in one transaction where farmers might be doing different things in different locations becomes possible within one transaction because we're actually creating a transaction that the, um, the roads traffic authority it used to be called, I can't think of what it's called right now, but the, um, the maritime, uh, the, the, the guys that manage the roads in the area, they spend you know, $4 million a year uh, cleaning up and repairing roads. So they're obvious, uh, an obvious potential acquirer of flood mitigation um, risk over and above the carbon benefits. Um, another key thing about having something like a, a co-op or a mutual at, at national scale is you can create this, 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 this large infrastructure to, to support this local based uh, transactions. So as I said at the start, the idea of a nature fund becomes comes possible because you've got the scale. So um, in our modeling, if we were able to, to have a, a $100 million bond, for example, issue um, that uh, we're replicating a transaction that was done in Kenya, where they uh, had a $100 million bond that uh, was used for deforestation, to avoid deforestation in Kenya. And the way that worked was you had investors like QBE invest in the bond and they could choose to receive carbon credits or interest on their bond. So uh, interest payment, they, they could either choose to receive carbon credits or they could, could choose to receive interest. And if they chose not to receive the carbon credits, the, 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 the issuer um, had a, 
uh, an option to, to sell those carbon credits to BHP at $5 a tonne. And that $5 a tonne would there, then go to pay the interest on, on the underlying bond. We can see that that kind of structure would work in this circumstance. And more than um, simply being able to enable carbon transaction, by creating a fund at that sort of scale, we can then start trying to unlock things like biodiversity, but also a whole of farm type um, outcomes that, uh, you know, so like people like AgForce have been looking into through their ag methodology that, you know, accounting for nature or looking at those kind of environmental outcomes. Those things become more, more achievable when you've got something at scale that, that the institutional market can deal with. And so we can see that the, the, the nature fund becomes a key component of, you know, creating infrastructure that farmers own and control. Similarly, on the, on the technology side, we can see that the, 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 the way the world's evolving, the data that goes to support these contracts. So we collect a lot of data with respect to environmental transactions, um, that that data um, is, is well, one, it's valuable, but two, we want, under our principles, we want farmers to control it. So we need to find a way that farmers can control the way that they, farmers, uh, that, that they, the data they have on farm can be shared with, against the contracts that are being um, created, these environmental contracts. And one of the, the, the outcomes of this is if we create this entity, that same data can then be used to demonstrate green provenance. So it becomes valuable as a tool for, for um, demonstrating the, you know, the, 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 um, the environmental values embedded in provenance. Anyway, I've probably hammered on too long. The, the final point I just wanted to make was that one of the, the outcomes, and Lorraine uh, alluded to it, was that um, by having a mutual structure, there's a, an element of um, peer compliance and peer review built into the model. Um, and you can think of that like in a health fund. And so by, by virtue of that, um, you're more likely under, you know, to, 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 to deliver uh, favourable outcomes than when you rely on regulation alone. So that was the point of that slide. And so in summary, um, it's a bit of a pot puri really, but in, in summary, if you look at the business process, uh, an idealised business process about how you go about creating a carbon transaction or environmental markets transaction, from engaging local farmers to defining a transaction to marketing to, 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 to potential buyers to execution to delivery, you can see how collaboration through a mutual or cooperative can de deliver value across that chain. And that, my friends, I think is it. I'll try and get out of here. Back to you, Simone. Thank you very much, Rowan. Great presentation. And I particularly like how you built on Lorraine's point about the importance of understanding the brokering process, which isn't highly transparent, but uh, can also be quite inundated with complexities that might not need to be there. So thank you very much. There are a couple of questions we'll come back to after we hear from Amanda. And finally today, I'd like to introduce Farming Together's program manager, Amanda Scott. Um, she's been a lover of all things farm, farms and farming since she was a child and has a plethora of formal qualifications, including um, sci a science background and agricultural background, um, teaching, as well as now doing her PhD in collaborative networks through Southern Cross University. Um, Amanda is extremely humble in her expertise, but draws on her extensive research into collaboration, along with expansive experiences working with close to 30,000 farmers across Australia through the Farming Together program since its conception. Amanda is deeply passionate about all things collaboration and farming and is here to speak with us today. Thanks, Thank Amanda. Thank you very much, Simone, for that introduction. And thanks to Rowan and Lorraine, like you, Simone. Um, Lorraine, we work closely together, but once again, my mind has been blown and expanded. So um, thanks to you and Rowan for that really big picture insightful um, overview as well. I think my, I guess my perspective is a little bit different. I'm not a carbon expert, but what I have had the privilege and opportunity to see over the last six years is several hundred different models of collaborations with primary producers across the country. Um, and so I guess what really excites 
it's been it's really reinforcing the message that Rowan and Lorraine have said is the opportunity here in this new and emerging at the moment a little bit confusing and perhaps messy space is this real opportunity for farmers and other primary producers to come together and find different ways of working together to ensure that they can maximise those benefits from those opportunities and retain those benefits for farmers. Um, so just for example, Simone and I a few months ago did a workshop up in um, the Tweed region with a number of farmers up there. We presented, I can't remember how many case studies, about 10, 10, case, 10 case studies um, of different opportunities for growing agriculture in the region. And by far the most popular and my, the topic that people were most interested about was the carbon farming. But one of the things they found what is, was also a really confusing space and they didn't quite know how to move forward. And I guess one of the messages that I want to leave in terms of there's an opportunity here to work together and that's how we move. Um, there's all different types of formal and informal collaborative and cooperative opportunities here. And, you know, Rowan's this, this idea of this national mutual, I think is fantastic. And I really look forward to seeing how that develops. But one of the things I, I, I guess I want people to think about and take away at this point in time is that it doesn't have to start at that big level. I mean, we've talked about the benefits of working together in these collaborations, creating that scale necessary, being able to pool those resources so you can pay to get those critical people to do those administrative roles or, um, you know, those, the, get that expert information you need. But it can also be as simple of just a group of interested people coming together at this point to share information, to share knowledge together, and from there to grow that opportunity and see where it goes. Um, so I guess, yeah, that it can start from the ground up and it can start by just, I mean, it, you know, if, even if people are interested in this space that are on this um, webinar today who want to continue this conversation, there's an opportunity there to just bring it together. Um, I do want to also point out, though, that collaboration can bring about really dramatic transformational changes but it's not also always successful so you do want to make sure that if you're going into a collaborative opportunity um, that you make sure that you have like-minded people and a clear vision of what you want to achieve together as you're moving forward. Um, I'm not really going to keep talking for very long I just wanted to really summarise and support what both uh, Rowan and Lorraine were saying and just say that um, I think there is such a significant opportunity to work together in this really exciting space and I'd be happy to take any questions or any specifics about what we've seen and learned in relation to collaboration and potentials for carbon farming. Thank you. Thank you Amanda and you might even want to speak to one of our questions that's in here from Richard O'Leary uh, who asked if there's a place for small local farmer co-ops and I assume he's meaning carbon cops in that. Are you, Richard? Yeah. Hi, Richard. Lovely to see you. Uh, <laughs> um, absolutely. I think there's definitely a place for small local farmer co-ops. And as we said, I don't think it even needs to start necessarily as a formal structure. Um, if I understand correctly, Rowan, your model is the mutuals operate can operate at that local space scale as well and grow. Um, and Lorraine, you may also have seen some examples of some smaller scale initiatives that uh, you're seeing, they're hitting the ground running. Yeah, um, I think it's important to remember with co you only need five members. Um, and it's also important to remember when you're talking carbon farming and you wanna go it on your own, like what we've done at our farm, um, you need a minimum of 400 hectares to make that worthwhile. And that's 400 hectares of carbon, of country that you can actually do carbon farming on. Um, so if you're talking a minimum of 400 hectares and you can combine at least five farmers, and they might be neighbours that you get on with, then, you know, you have the beginnings of what could be um, a, a a great cooperative. So you don't need to bring all and sundry on it at 
together. You just need to find the people you know you work with well and that you get along with. That's the most important thing um, is trust. In any group like that, you've got to have the trust. So, yeah, it's it's not as big and hard and ugly and hairy as it sometimes comes across. Yeah, yeah. Um, I 100% agree that um, and the, the, while the mutual is creating infrastructure, so the idea is to, to be able to leverage large numbers of smaller groups to where those smaller groups are effectively enabling the creation of infrastructure that can support them collectively, in a sense. And so, um, for example, we're working with Landcare New South Wales and Landcare Victoria to um, engage their groups it's, it, um, to go, right, at that, because at that land care group size may actually be the ideal size for a transaction. Not, you know, it might be different in different areas, um, depending on who's involved. But um, yeah, the idea is a group can come together and go, right, what is the opportunity in our space? And it may be that like it's a, a single opportunity, or there might be different types of opportunity in that in that catchment or region region area uh, regional area. And then go right. Well, what is that opportunity? And then the next question is, well, what do we need to do in order to take advantage of that opportunity? Is in what's our, the investment we need to make? And then who's prepared to pay for it? In a sense, the mutual where the mutual really comes in is it like ideally has a mechanism to enable you know farmers to access the market at scale. So to, so to connect with the market. Now, if you're going straight to the, the you know the ERF, then you might be selling straight into the you know the government anyway. So that may not be you know that that's in itself a closed solution but um yeah great thanks rowan um we did have another couple of questions just about your presentation so one from bob davy um i think it was in relation to slide number eight if you wanted to go back there at all but um he was just saying that the price on your graph showed US $50 a tonne of CO2 for the Australian ERF, um, but the actual price average over 12 ERF auctions is Australian $14.35. Why the difference? Uh, I think it was uh, $10 US. Okay. Um, so which is $14 Australia. Um, can you see that screen or I stuck yeah. up? Yep. We've got the building the regen farmers mutual. Yeah, yeah, we've got it. Yeah, that's that one ten dollars US a ton. Oh, beautiful! Does that clear um, that one up for you, Bob? And um, another one from John Hancock, who just asked, um, was the interest, and this was in relation to to slide sixteen, um, is there a place? Oh, sorry, um, was the interest cash or carbon? That you were talking about. Slide six. <laughs> if if we're talking about the um, the example I gave with respect to yeah yeah so if we're talking about the interest um, the bond mm. so, so the bond issue was um, a triple A rated twenty five year um, one hundred and fifty million dollar US issue right so it was one hundred the the uh, international finance corporation undertook this bond issue. It was invested by the likes of someone like QBE as one of the investors. QBE are looking for a, an interest rate coupon. They're in, looking for interest on their debt and then they're looking for, to get the, you know, the, the money back at the end. So the interest that QBE, they could have chosen, they could choose at any given interest date, pays interest every six months. They could, could choose to receive carbon credits equivalent to the interest amount they, they, they're expecting. But if they don't choose to receive the carbon credits, then those carbon credits are sold to BHP at $5 a tonne, and that then pays the interest that the, the investor, QBE, is looking for. Does that make sense? Yeah, I'll just wait to hear back from John in the... Yep, all good, Rowan, thank you. Uh, we've had a, a question from uh, Kirsty Cooper. Um, who's the Environmental Policy Manager at Australian Pork. Is there scope for mutuals in other carbon projects such as biogas rather than land-based approaches? Lorraine, did you 
<laughs> yeah, okay. So so the question is, is there other, just say it again, what a question was, sorry, Simone. That's okay. Is there scope for mutuals in other carbon projects such as biogas rather than land-based approaches? Well, um, I would imagine absolutely. I mean, the mutual is set up as a structure to be able to capitalise on all sorts of market mechanisms um, in this space. But at, I mean, at the moment, their focus is on, I mean, Rowan, you can talk to this as well, as the focus is on carbon and biodiversity credits and offsets. Um, but there is no reason why once that structure is in place, if opportunities as they arise, they wouldn't look at other market mechanisms as well. Um, you know, I guess it depends on what the, the will is of the members. It's up to the members to decide where they're going to get um, the most, uh, I guess, bang for their bucks. And I would imagine in, at this point in time, it would be more in the land-based activities, but yeah, your thoughts, Rowan, on that? Well, there are examples like Hepburn Wind, for example. In um, so they've got the local community gathered together into a cooperative, and they built a um, wind turbine, and so and that's generating electricity for the local area, and and uh, you know carbon credits off the back of that. Um, there'll be other examples where there'll be you know whether it's solar on farms, um, so. By all means, yeah. Um, if there's if there's an opportunity for people to come together to collectively own an asset, um, cooperatives and mutuals are an ideal way to do it. Hmm. Brilliant, thank you. Um, we've got another question from Elizabeth. With higher carbon prices overseas, why bother trading in Australian Australia at this stage? Um, I'm happy to have a crack at that one. Uh, Look, I think it's the same old story, really. It just makes damn good business sense to keep your options open. Um, so you don't know that if you rely just on one market, you never know whether that market could fall in a heap tomorrow. And, and a good example of that is, I can remember when I was up in the Northern Territory and I spoke to the a whole bunch of cattle farmers up there and I said, does it not worry you that you only have one one market at the moment and that's Indonesia as a live cattle export market and you know you don't have an abattoir and you don't have any means of any other options to sell your cattle and they said no 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 nothing will ever happen to the live cattle trade to Indonesia well we all saw how that worked for them um, and then all of a sudden we had an abattoir getting built there pretty quickly after that exercise so I guess it just makes good business sense to keep your options open. And, you know, it's probably likely that Korea may not want, even though they pay $40, $50 um, per ACU, they may not want our carbon here because they can get it somewhere else that they'd rather do business with. So just because there is a market out there that's worth more doesn't mean that they'll necessarily want what we've got. Uh, so again, you know, it's typical market mechanisms. Um, and in many regards, it works quite, it's a bit similar to the stock exchange. You know, you'll, you'll take what you can get at the time that's the best price that suits you. And those that are looking for um, to buy your carbon credits um, will be doing the same thing. So yeah, you know, you, you look at it at the time and see who's, who's gonna pay you what, who's gonna pay you the highest price, just like any auction system. Yep, great. Thanks, Lorraine. Um, <laughs> no, no, it's good. Uh, Elizabeth just said thanks. Still stick to risk spreading and get the best value you can. Yep. Um, John's asking another question. Be good to know what percentage of funders accept interest payments as carbon credits, as this would be a contained immediate economy and a good early differentiator for sourcing funders, especially if this is going to become a seller's market. Um, it, really interesting um, conversation to be had around where the corporate market is in Australia with respect to um, buying carbon credits and buying carbon credits with co-benefits. Um, so this is the voluntary market we're talking about here. It's not the regulated market selling to the government. Um, the, and as I say, it was part of that, that um, exercise last year where we interviewed the likes of Athiona locally, um, who are the largest... Um, 
engineer engineering firm creating windmills globally. They're Spanish, and they 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 bought uh, Lendlease or they bought uh, Abbey Group out of Lendlease and what have you. So it was interesting talking to to, to them because the people we were talking to had been part of one engineering company and had become part of this global Spanish company. And they went, it was amazing. We thought as part of Lendlease, we were um, very, you know, social responsibility was a key filter for us. But joining this this large um, Spanish outfit, so Germany, I'm sorry, um, Europe being um, maybe more sensitive to, to climate than, than Australia is with respect to, um, you know, the way corporates are, where the corporates are at. I said, like joining this large Spanish outfit, um, it was amazing that, that like, rather than um, as part of Lend Lease, our first filter was, um, our first metric that we always spoke to was, there was no injury time. The first filter that they speak to is the climate impact. So like how many carbon credits, what water is being used. And so it was amazing that change of focus. So what, I was what I'm trying to get to is there, that the Australian corporate market has varying degrees of kind of um, appetite for carbon plus co-benefits. So someone, so the retail sector um, in Australia, for example, is really much more interested in that whole of farm concept, um, retail being like the Coles and Woolies and what have you. They're really interested in that whole of farm concept because that speaks more to their, to what, to what they need as opposed to like a, a Woodside or a BHP who have a very definitive kind of carbon exposure. So that was a long winded way of saying that in terms of that structure I des described, the, the, the challenge there is to find who the parties are that you can enter into these off-take agreements with that will, so the BHP that will underwrite the payment of interest in the event that the, the, the investors don't want the, the interest coupon. So that's, that's really the key driver there. Um, and so who might be the buyers there? Well, the, the first people, you know, the first entities you would go to would be the energy companies, for example, in Australia. Um, so I, so in answer to, you, to your question, I'm not sure it's about um, what percentage of funders would accept interest payments to carbon credits, although that would be part of the process. It, it really is digging down to find out, well, how many, you know, what is the appetite in the corporate sector for this type of car you know, carbon being generated on the farm? Brilliant. Thanks, Rowan. And we're going to have one more question. If you've got any other questions, do feel free to email us at farmingtogether at scu.edu.au. We're happy to respond um, because I know many of you are having to leave now. But I will pose this last one. It's for you, Lorraine. It might be off topic, but I'm curious about Lorraine's mention of land that isn't suitable for carbon farming. How do we, how do we find or know which land can and can't capture carbon? Mm. Yeah, okay. Um, so this has been quite a debatable topic. And I, I put a lot more hectares in when I first went in, into this um, registration process, uh, only to find out that they took a lot of the hectares out because of tree coverage and this definition of what forestry is. Now, that's come from an international definition. Um, thank God that's been now put aside, um, uh, the ERF has put that aside, because I argued along with others that if I can take a lime truck up to under those trees, and if I can graze cattle right under those trees, then I can sequester carbon. And if I'm not looking for um, making money out of my, um, my tree trees or, you know, double dipping, so to speak, then I should be able to claim carbon credits where I can take a tractor on the farm. End of story. That's not a forest. What that is, is grassy woodlands. Um, so it was all about the narrative and the definitions. So one of the things that they will do when it's when you're all mapped out and they're, they're looking at the area, they have to take out, obviously, you know, those very steep contoured areas and those heavy tree belted areas um, from the soil carbon measuring um, scenario and you know they may well in the future be able to come under something else um, but yeah you just you need that open for soil carbon you do need reasonably opened areas to be able to do it so I guess that's that's where I was coming from doesn't mean you can't have another section that you use for biodiversity offsets and credits um, but yeah so there was just you know, we got stuck on this definition of what's forestry and what's grassy woodland. 
And I mean, yeah. if you, sorry, uh, That's right. I think it was anything over two metres was considered a, a, a forest. So, mm. you know, in many Australian conditions, that knocks a lot of farms right out of the scenario for soil carbon. But thank God that's that has been changed now and it's opened up a lot more opportunities. Brilliant. Thanks, Lorraine. And on that note, uh, Steve said thanks as well. I will say a huge thank you and invite you to our webinar next week um, where we're looking at steps in carbon farming, um, including methodologies and options. Our communications manager, Melissa Goldman, has just popped the link in the chat if you're interested in jumping on and registering now. And thank you to all. This webinar will be available through the Farming Together website, farmingtogether.com.au, if you want to listen or re-listen to any of that again. Thank you very much, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye. Thanks, Lorraine. Thanks, Rowan. Thanks, Amanda. Everyone.